Good day to everyone. I am Janelle Andrea Uy and for my presentation in this bioassay forum, I will be discussing an antimicrobial assay. References state that there is no single all-embracing bioassay to evaluate antimicrobial activity. Instead, it is evaluated by a number of bioassay methods and careful comparison of all data to come up with an appropriate conclusion. However, the focus of this presentation is just on the agar dilution method. Kindly refer to Ms. Chong's and Mr. Asunshan's reports for the other methods. Just a quick run through of the flow of my presentation. I'll discuss first the journal details, its objectives, the salient points of the bioassay method, other methods performed, and finally, the proposed innovations. Let's start with the journal details. The chosen article is entitled The Evaluation of the Antibacterial and Antifungal Properties of Fragmentera Capitata, Bal, Loranthaceae, a mistletoe growing on rubber tree using the dilution techniques. The article was published in the Scientific World Journal, Fall of 2017. The authors are Franklin Ohikena, Olubun Miwintola, and Anthony Afolayan, whom are all Nigerian. The research site was conducted at the University of Fort Hare in South Africa. The Objective The study aims to evaluate the antibacterial and fungal activities of P. capitata that is parasitic on rubber tree, Hevea brasiliensis, on different human and animal pathogenic strains of microorganisms using the agar and broth dilution techniques. Moving on to the bioassay method, starting with the sample. So the plant sample used in the study were leaves of authenticated P. capitata, a mistletoe growing from mature rubber plantations at the Rubber Research Institute of Nigeria. Let me discuss how the plant sample was prepared. So leaves were removed from the twigs, rinsed gently to remove dust and dirt, Air dried at room temperature in a well aerated atmosphere and prevented from direct sunlight to avoid denaturation of phytal phytal constituents. So the dried leaves were then pulverized. For the extraction procedure, 100 grams of powdered plant sample were extracted by maceration and shaking with acetone, methanol, ethanol, and water for 24 hours. The crude extracts were filtered using a Buckner funnel and Wattman filter paper. So the aqueous extract obtained was freeze-dried while the acetone, methanol, and ethanol extracts were further concentrated and evaporated to dryness in vacuum. So for the concentration of the extract, a stock solution of 500 mg per ml, which was initially dissolved in a little amount of TMSO, and made up with either Muller Hinton broth for the antibacterial assay and Saburo dextrot broth for the antifungal assay were prepared. So twofold serial dilutions of the stock in broth were then made in these following concentrations. Presented here are the test microorganisms, test extracts, and positive controls used in the study. All microbial strains were sourced from the Medicinal Plants and Economic Development Research Center of the same university. These organisms were chosen because of their roles as opportunistic pathogens to humans and animals, as well as their association with stomach disorders, diarrhea, dysentery, wound, and other infections. In this way, the ethnopharmacological claims of P. capitata as a remedy for such diseases can be validated. As you can see, all the test extracts were tested against the 10 bacteria strains using the agar and broth microdilution method. Ciprofloxacin was used as the standard drug. For the antifungal assay, these four fungal isolates were used and tested on all the test extracts employing the agar dilution method only. Nicetin was the standard drug used. Allow me to discuss how the bacterial inoculum was prepared. 
using the direct colony suspension method. So 3 to 5 morphologically similar colonies from fresh muller hinton agar plates were transferred with the loop into about 5 ml of normal saline in a cap test tube and then vortex. The suspension form was adjusted to give a turbidity equivalent to that of a 0.5 McFarland standard to give an approximate of 150 million colony forming units or CFU per ml. So the adjusted colony was then diluted in a ratio of 1 is to 100 in Muller-Hinton broth to give a colony suspension of 1 million CFU per ml. So the final suspension concentration was 10,000 CFU per spot. Instead of spectrophotometric assessment of the density, I believe the authors use a turbidity standard as a visual yardstick to save time since then bacteria strains were used. So this is acceptable according to standard guidelines. Meanwhile, the fungal inoculum was prepared as follows. Fungal strains were freshly subcultured on sterile several dextrose agar and incubated at 30 degrees Celsius for 2 to 5 days. The resultant cells and spores were washed into sterile normal saline and the turbidity is adjusted this time to a 0.5 McFarland standard equivalent. This results in 1 million CFU per ml. The suspension is further diluted in a 1 to 10 ratio in saborodextrose broth to give a turbidity of 500,000 CFU per ml. So how is the agar dilution assay actually performed? To give a rough overview, Solutions with defined numbers of bacterial cells are spotted directly onto the nutrient agar plates that have incorporated different antibiotic concentrations. After incubation, the presence of bacterial colonies on the plates indicates growth of the organism. The methods followed by the authors were based on Wigan et al.'s protocol and the standard guidelines by the European Committee for Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing. The augers were prepared according to the manufacturer's instructions. They were autoclave at 121 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes. Now this is a critical step. Higher temperatures might inactivate the antibiotic, whereas at lower temperatures, the agar will begin forming solid clumps making it, it now difficult to pour into homogeneous plates. Next, the agars were then allowed to cool to 50 degrees Celsius in a water bath. Then about 0.5 ml from the twofold serial dilutions of the extracts was added to 24.5 ml of the molten agar in the water bath. They were then swirled and poured onto petri dishes cooled, and then solidified. 10 microliter each from both the prepared bacterial and fungal inoculum was delivered on the solidified agar surface to give the desired final inoculum concentration of 10,000 CFU per spot and 1,000 CFU per ml, respectively. It is actually recommended to inoculate the antibiotic containing agar plates starting with the lowest concentration. Shown in this slide are the final extract and standard concentrations for the antimicrobial assays. The same authors have published a research article on the toxicity assessment of the same solvent extracts in various concentrations back in 2016. Toxicity testing was performed on Artemia salina, commonly known as brine shrimp. With an LC50 of more than 1 mg per ml, the extracts were considered to be non-toxic. I believe the data gathered in the toxicity study were used as the basis for the doses employed in the chosen article. For the data collection using the agar dilution method, bacteria plates were incubated at 37 degrees Celsius and readings were taken between 16 and 20 hours and after 3 days of incubation. Minimum inhibitory concentration or MIC values are used to determine susceptibilities of bacteria to drugs and also to evaluate the activity of new antimicrobial agents. 
MIC is determined visually as the lowest concentrations of the extracts at which no bacterial growth was visible. Meanwhile, the fungal plates were incubated at 30 degrees Celsius. Initial reading was obtained after 2 to 3 days, while second reading was done after 5 days. Likewise, MIC was determined in the same manner. Now, for the results and analysis. Gram-negative bacteria were found to be more defiant and susceptible to the crude extracts in the agar-dilution method after 16 to 20 hours of incubation. Next, the lowest activity for aqueous extract compared to the organic solvent extracts were found. However, if you will notice, res azurine brought microdilution technique proved to be more sensitive than the agar dilution method. This is evidently observed in the aqueous extract tested on B. cholera, S. typhi, and E. coli. Then, the ciprofloxacin, which is the standard drug, demonstrated great antibacterial activity, having an MIC of less than or equal to 2 micrograms per ml in the agar dilution while 0.0625 to 0.25 micrograms per ml in the broth microdilution. So at this point, I just want to add that biocompounds of parasitic plants are chiefly dependent on their hosts. Hence, one may notice that the same parasitic plant may exhibit different antimicrobial activities on different hosts. This table presents the results of the bactericidal activity in terms of minimum bactericidal concentration or MBC of the extracts and agar dilution MIC after 3 days of incubation. Organic solvent extracts exhibited more bactericidal activity on E. coli, while contrastingly, no bactericidal activity on P. aeruginosa. MBC for organic extracts range from 2.5 mg per ml to 10 mg per ml with the acetone extract having the best activity. There was a comparable result of MIC obtained after incubation for a prolonged time to the MBC, with the MICs ranging from 2.5 mg ml to more than 5 mg per ml for the crude extracts. Next. Variation in the MIC of ciprofloxacin in the agar dilution method was also noted. At 4 micrograms per ml, V. cholera and K. pneumonia continued to grow, but the same organisms were killed in the bactericidal test. This gives insight to the shelf life or duration of action of the extracts against microorganisms. If you would look closely on the previous tables, Organisms that were initially inhibited by the extracts after 20 hours, however, recovered and continued growth. One possible reason for this occurrence is that antibacterial biocompounds present in the extracts may have become weak and less active already. Therefore, bacteria that were still alive recovered and continued to grow. So this poses as a disadvantage of the agar dilution technique. Organisms that continued growth may not have been properly dissolved in the agar in the first place, which led to a reduced extract activity beyond its threshold. On the other hand, this table shows the antifungal activities of the solvent extracts on selected human pathogenic fungi. So T. mycoides and C. albicans were found to be resistant, while T. tonsurans and A. nigger were susceptible. Results after 5 days of incubation were similar to the first observation, except in the ethyl extracts in both T. tonsurans and A. nigger. So interestingly, a very high susceptibility in the aqueous extract was observed in all the fungi acid, which remained unchanged after 5 days of incubation. So this implies that water poses to be a good solvent to extract antifungal agents in the plant. And lastly, nicotine showed a high MIC on all the tested organisms. This figure just shows how the antifungal MICs were determined. The spots on the plates indicate fungi growth. 
hence resistance of the organism at that concentration. So if you can notice at the bottom right part, again, very high antifungal activity was observed for the aqueous extracts than the organic solvent extracts, since there was no as much visible growth. Direct comparison of all the MIC values were presented in tabular form. So no statistical tests or other tools to analyze the data were mentioned in the study. To conclude, P. capitata harvested from rubber trees have the ability to inhibit both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria effectively. It has the potential as an antibiotic in the pharmaceutical industry and an alternative remedy in therapeutics. It has exhibited antifungal ability and it has supported the claim at the pharmacological uses against gastrointestinal infections and other opportunistic diseases of man and animals. For the other methods, so just to reiterate, broth microdilution assay using res azurin in a 96 well microtiter plate was also performed to evaluate the antibacterial potential of the crude extracts. So I will not elaborate on this method further as it was discussed by Mr. Asuncion already. The authors of this study employed a similar procedure. So I just want to emphasize here that aside from MIC, minimum bactericidal concentration or MBC was also determined and compared to the MIC as discussed in the results earlier. For the last part, I am proposing some innovations that I hope will address the limitations of the study and improve efficiency of the model used. First is using a negative control and obtaining baseline data. The rationale behind is to compare the results of the new test samples to known results for validity and conclusiveness. And this is to verify that the negative control truly produces a null result. So this is just an additional procedure. Only a positive control using standard commercial drugs were used in the study. However, a negative control using the solvent, DMSO, should have been included to ensure that the observed inhibitions of microbial growth can be solely attributed to the test samples and other factors or variables are not responsible. Next, it was not explicitly mentioned in the article that a growth control plate was used in the antibacterial agar dilution method. It was only for the broth microdilution and for the antifungal assay. The viable count of the bacteria suspension used for preparing the initial inoculum should have been determined. In the reference protocol, it was stated that for the test to be valid, the presence of around 100 to 200 colonies on this control agar plate is expected. By employing such measures, baseline data may be established to better help the researchers follow an accurate experimental approach and compare the results. These serve to rule out possible non-causal interpretations of the results. Second is the optimum pH of the extracts. The rationale is to allow optimum growth of microorganisms in the culture medium. As an additional procedure, the pH of the sample extracts must be checked using a pH paper or a pH meter before incorporation into the medium. Raman Chowdhury and Thompson stated in their book that the growth of microorganisms may be retarded in environments which are excessively acidic or basic. The advisable pH is around the neutral range, around pH 6 to 8, and alternatively, the extracts can be dissolved in a buffer solution like the physiological TRIS buffer. Third is the correlation of the results with phytochemical constituents. The rationale is to determine the phytochemical constituents responsible for the observed antimicrobial properties. This is to give insight on the possible mechanism of action of the plant sample and the test microbes. So in 2018, the same authors have conducted another research on the same plant extracts which identified and quantified their phytochemical constituents. A copy of this study can be found in my uploaded PDF of journal articles. In their results, acetone and ethanol extracts were found to have significantly higher phenolic content compared to methanol and aqueous extracts. And among all the extracts, acetone had significantly more flavonoid and proanthocyanidin contents. 
And so flavonoids are phenolic structures found abundantly in photosynthesizing cells. So along with other phytoconstituents, they were reported to exhibit various antibacterial activities. In addition, proanthocyanidins were found to be active antibacterial agents as well, according to Mayer et al. Lastly, is the incorporation of a biomimetic membrane sensor in the agar medium. So current agar dilution techniques are said to be simple while having a cost-effective readout. Although it has demonstrated good reliability in determining MICs, culture time to ensure CFU formation is long. Results are normally not obtained within the same day. As mentioned earlier, there were organisms that recovered and continued their growth. Therefore, a means of increasing the speed of detection of CFUs in the culture medium is of interest. As you may have already know, the cell membrane is composed majorly of a lipid bilayer and of proteins with vital roles such as in signal transduction, transportation of various ions and molecules across the membrane, and sensing of the environment. Placement of lipid bilayers on solid supports has been a popular approach for mimicking membrane environments. Consequently, these biobimetic membranes have been found to be useful tools in biosensing applications. Kim et al. reported in detail how several types of synthetic biomimetic membranes can be produced and how they can be utilized as templates for sensor platforms or for new biosensors per se. Tian and Stadler reviewed the recent developments and applications of PDA-based sensors since 2014, among which include the detection of the influenza virus, Point of care devices for diagnosis and monitoring of various medical conditions through biomarkers, and the determination of heavy metal content in food, biological systems, or the environment. Allow me to discuss first the PDA that I mentioned. Polydiacetylene, or PDA, falls under a unique class of conjugated polymeric materials that combines highly ordered backbones with customizable side chains. The first preparation of PDA was described by Wegner back in the 1969. PDA is usually formed through the 1,4 addition of diacetylene monomers irradiated with UV or gamma light. This generates the polymeric backbone with alternating C double bond C and C triple bond C bonds. Via polymerization, it becomes physically, thermally, and mechanically stable as compared to chemical and other modes of preparation. PDA has a known unique optical feature as well. This is brought about by the extensively delocalized pi electron networks and conformational restrictions along its main backbone. So this shows as an absorption peak at around 640 nanometers and appears visually as a deep blue color. What's more interesting is its capability to undergo rapid colorimetric transitions upon interaction with an external stimuli or by various perturbations to the conjugated framework. So it was observed that the main absorption peak shifts hypsochromically to around 540 nanometers, seen then as a red color. Moreover, fluorescence is captured only in this red phase, allowing high-throughput screening of target analytes. Let's now apply these concepts into the antimicrobial assay. Again, I am proposing to embed synthetic phospholipids and the chromatic polymer PDA in the agar medium. The phospholipids will mimic the membrane bilayer of, say, specific human cells, while the PDA serves as the colorimetric or fluorescent signal. This figure roughly represents the schematic description of biomolecular sensing with lipid PDA vesicles. The green bodies are the phospholipids, and they are seen to adopt a bilayer structure within the PDA matrix, the blue ones. When the inoculated bacteria proliferates and secretes compounds such as membrane-active peptides and toxins, which diffuse through this agar matrix, a blue to red color transition will be observed just several hours after incubation. Meanwhile, a fluorescence emission at around 540 nanometers can be initially detected after around 6 hours.
these periods are way shorter than the usual time for bacterial colonies to form that is visible to the naked eye. This not only addresses one of the limitations of the study, but also allows rapid screening of large number of possible antimicrobial compounds. This is a generic method and hence can be employed for both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Nonetheless, high specificity by the PDA-based color sensors towards biological analytes can still be achieved. It is through careful molecular design of the lipid assemblies. Intermolecular modification of the head groups of PDAs can be done. Recognition elements like antibodies, aptamers, bacteriophages, and electrostatic interaction-based ligands as nanoparticles can be incorporated into the PDA vesicle framework to specifically recognize and bind to epitopes on the surface of the certain bacteria used in the study. Here are my references. Apologies for the quite lengthy presentation, but I do hope that you'll learn something new today. Thank you and have a nice day!